juice known as Dr. Pot, I like to call him Andrew Catalaris, who I told you about before, is unquestionably Australia's sort of pioneer on cannabis and hemp research. So he's driven up from near Sydney yesterday and really appreciate him coming. He's a champion. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> then we'll have a break. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, just a few comments on some of those questions. It's really hard without the science. Now, you're allowed to go and buy breathalysers and you can test yourself after you've had a bottle of wine with your dinner. You can test yourself whether you're going to be compliant with the law or not. A good step would be if we could get access to the Draeger test so we can actually know at what stage we are or are not compliant. That in no way reduces our need to campaign against these laws because they're the thin edge of pharmacofascism. You've really got to see things. There is nothing that has developed in this country in the last 10 years that's good, and almost everything is bad. We're sliding down a slope of pharmacofascism. By that I mean the good drugs are restricted and the bad drugs are pushed, right? So nothing that I say about getting around these tests should influence the way you think about the people who applied these tests. Now, it goes back more than 15 years. I was having a debate with a group of detectives in the drug squad, which is a waste of time, uh, about medical. And one of the bastards, I can remember his nasty expression and his nasty comment. He said, Andrew, he says, you think you're a bloody smart aleck, don't you? You might get medical cannabis, but we'll get you on the roads. Right? I mean, I'm a pacifist in theory, but I would have shot that piece of shit in the head, <laughs> right, for, for what he said then. Now, having said that, because we can't get access to the Draeger testing very easily, Someone I know who's of reasonable reliability did get a small box of the tests and what his findings were, the fisherman's friend, the apple cider vinegar didn't work very impressively. The only substance that he found blocked effectively, and remember this is second hand but it's as near as I've got, is 6% hydrogen peroxide. So you put 10 mils in your mouth and swish it around very thoroughly, hold it in for as long as you can. You can feel it bubbling and frothing. And there may be a very good reason why that actually um, is effective. The other question that was brought up by Sally and co is the split opinion on whether oral saliva, if you say have a suppository, will it show up in your oral saliva? The only thing I can add to that is that there's two different professors giving two different versions, so I don't know. And you can't know until you test it, right? So don't say to the judge, oh, fuck, mate, you know, I only took 10 suppositories. I didn't think it would show up in my saliva. I don't think that'll work as a defence either, right? But evidently, to the best of my knowledge, is 6% hydrogen peroxide, right, for in the mouth as long as you can have it, and it'll whiten your teeth while it's there, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Now, Mike, Michael said that um, I've not only involved in medical cannabis, but also in industrial hemp, and in fact I started my activism in 1988 with industrial hemp, because my overview of health is that if you don't have a healthy planet, we're not gonna have healthy people. Now this isn't rocket science. You think anyone with two neurons that were cooperating with each other would arrive at the same idea. You can't be healthy in a polluted atmosphere or drinking polluted water. I come up here, I live on a farm with rainwater. You turn on the tap here, it smells like worse than most swimming pools with the amount of chlorine. But I'll certainly be addressing fluoride as well, which is a major issue in my next serious campaign. Okay, sister. Now, paradigms. What I'm, I'm going to talk about is the need for a paradigm shift. A lot of people come here because they're sick or their loved ones are sick and they want a quick fix because that's the way the whole of this Western world works. You know, there's cosmetics, there's things for your teeth, there's things for your hair, there's a problem. Oh, look, you can do this, this will make you look thinner. There's a whole lot of quick fixes. But until we fix the way we think, we won't fix any of our problems, right? I saw some graffiti on a wall way back in the 60s and it says that a society that's based on private ownership and profit motive is not a society at all but a state of conflict. And we're really in a state of conflict. But unfortunately, the people are becoming more timid and the corporations are becoming more bold, right? And that's a very, very unfortunate thing. So we need an overall paradigm shift. That means just not looking at one part, but looking at everything. Okay, 
I'm just, that's a self obvious question. Are the current paradigms working? All right, what are the current paradigms? Right, resources in the environment. Uh, gee, that's a good quote. <laughs> um, I tend to, to look at religion. Now everyone says, oh everyone, you should respect people's opinions. What I say to that is everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts, right? And it's true that you can tell a tree by its fruit. What has a Judeo-Christian religion given us, except probably one of the greatest con jobs in all of recorded history? But worse than that, the way it's been interpreted is that the planet is here for us to plunder, right? Remember, I think um, somewhere in, in one of those silly books, it says, you know, look at all the animals and all the plants, you can have them all, you can do what you want with them. That's not the case. We're just part of an intensely interactive biological web. Unfortunately, with our clever brains and our opposable thumbs, we came up with technology. We came up with a club. And over about 10,000 years of evolution, that's now a predator drone that can send a sort of a hellfire missile into someone's wedding party in Afghanistan, right? So we very much disjointed from our natural realities. And whilst we may be able to moderate the symptoms of disease, right, until the human spirit is alive, and that entails looking after the earth that we walk on, you'll never be as healthy as you can be, right? It's something that's worth striving for. Health is much more than the absence of disease, right? It's an another layer, another order of magnitude higher than that. Okay, next please, sister. This is their forest policy. Now, I saw a little comment, um, there was a cartoon actually, there was a great big logger standing on this huge stump holding his chainsaw and he says, of course we're leaving some of the forest for future generations, we're leaving the bottom parts. And that might be funny in a way, but if you look at what happens to societies through history, has anyone heard of Jared Diamond here in his book Collapse? Fascinating book, he looks at the role of different behaviours in the collapse or survival of society. Most of them chop down the trees, then die, right? It's as simple as that. He looked at six different societies. There was only one society that managed to reverse a near death scenario, and that was in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. There's this thing where they study the pollen contents. They take core samples down into the dirt and under lakes and things, and by looking microscopically at the different pollens, you can see whether there's predominant grasses or predominant trees and which trees and how they change over time. And when they do this, it's called palynology. When they do these palynology tests, the usual thing is, as the tree pollens come down, the human fragments build up and then there's nothing, right? So they basically, it's like the Easter Island scenario. They chop down all the trees to make their big Maui statues and then they ended up eating each other and then there was nothing, right? Don't laugh about it, mate, because we're no different than all those other failed societies. We're on that trajectory. The only exception, and the very inspiring exception that he included, were the highlands of New Guinea. Now, we're accustomed to think of these people with bones through their noses and bows and arrows running after each other in tribal wars. But they, if I can get the time scale right, a couple of thousand years ago, they looked like they were following the trajectory of all societies, the population building up, the trees going down, right? But then over a period of several hundred years, there was an obvious and conscious, presumably, attempt to reforestate. So suddenly, instead of this arrest, this reduction in tree pollen, there was an upsurge in the tree pollen. And the highlands of New Guinea have managed to sustain populations at a density as high as anywhere in the world for thousands of years because of that simple manoeuvre. And that's something we have, to, we have to keep in mind. There's a lot of advertising on Facebook and things about the Pilibra, uh, the, uh, uh, the forest down there, their, their logging Kalang State Forest. I mean, the avaricious monster never rests. And it's easy to say, oh, that's another issue and just let it pass out of your inbox or whatever way you're contacted. But we're watching a slow and very painful form of social suicide if we don't take action. Okay, next please. 
That's not very good. Um, I, I took it from a thumbnail. That is actually a beach covered in plastic litter. Now, are you all aware of the Central Pacific Gyra? Have you all heard of that? I spoke to the person who discovered it, Mr Silverstein, he's a marine biologist. He says, I knew about it for 15 years and was trying to raise awareness for 15 years before it got known. He says, but the bad news is that's only one of them. There's five more. The Central Pacific Gyra, a gyra is a big swirling current. There's a 700 kilometre mass of rotting plastic existing about a metre below the ocean and about to a depth of three metres, which is now starting to strand. So the plastic is biodispersible, but not biodegradable. And what's worse, because of the poly, uh, the PC, uh, PCAs, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, sorry, the poly polychlorinated biphenyls that they put in the plastic and other plastic chemicals, the whole of the marine environment is being poisoned. It's like almost putting them on oral contraception. There's more birth defects. There's all sorts of problems and no real strategy for dealing with this mess. I mean, you've all seen pictures of the seabirds with their guts swollen up with plastic bags and things. But yet, can you go and buy a simple set of groceries without getting three or four of these? Even when they try to ban single-use plastic bags, what's happened? Are we the last country on earth that's doing that? Those stupid little soft green bags, what's wrong with paper bags? Buckets and boxes, there's all sorts of ways. And people say, oh, it's too convenient. I mean, most of my life I existed without single-use plastic bags and I managed, right? And I'm sure we can all manage. But we have to make a noise about just about every issue. If I buy something now from a shop, uh, and I try to keep my consumerism to a minimum, unpack it at the shop and leave them the packing, right? Things like that. It's nonsense the way we're doing it. Why don't we have, for instance, a deposit on plastic by the kilo and charge the, the sellers of this stuff? But, you know, we're just going on in this blithe sleepwalk to our destruction, right? Now, is there anyone here that doesn't think human activity is having a major impact on our ecology? Is there anyone at all? They're all in Canberra. Right, there's a lot of them there, but it's a real worry when the people driving the car don't feel the need to obey the road rules, because that's what we're dealing with. Why is there such a disparate finding between the population? We're meant to be a democracy, it's meant to be the will of the people. It's not. The people are being treated with contempt by a group of corporate rewarded thugs to our detriment. Okay, next sister. I can't come up here and talk to people without mentioning Fukushima, or Fukushima as they more commonly said. I presume everyone's heard about it, but how much have you heard about it in the last week or the last year? It's been going on for eight years now. It's the world's first meltdown. There are three meltdowns happening just to the north of this country. Everyone know what a meltdown is? It's when the nuclear fusion reaction a nuclear reactor is basically just a big kettle. It's a huge stainless steel vessel that has these nuclear fusion going on. When it gets too hot, it melts down. And there's something like six inches of stainless steel. It burnt through that in the first week. And then six foot of concrete, it's already burnt through that. And now this nuclear fire is bubbling in the dirt. And no one really knows how to put it out. So you know what they're doing, the TEPCO company in Japan? They're pumping 300 tonnes of seawater onto it each day and just letting it just wash out to sea. That's just an indication of how cesium was detected on the west coast of the United States in the first few months after the tsunami, right? You know what the American government did? They raised the safety levels of cesium exposure and stopped doing monitor testing, right? We're in the hands of psychopaths, right? I can't stress this enough. We are looking at the death of the Pacific Ocean. Building 4, which is one of the buildings that illegally housed 10 years of spent fuel rods, they're meant to only have one year at a time and then they clean them out and send them to Australia to be sort of buried in the desert or something like that. But they had 10 years, as it turned out. There was a chemical explosion. I don't know if you can remember back to those years. There was a big explosion on one of the buildings. That blew one of the legs out of Building 4. So now we've got a building housing 1,200 fuel rods in a swimming pool, 
right, teetering above the Pacific Ocean on three legs. They've been sending robots in to try and shore it up, right, because there's only three legs on this huge building. The robots are dying under the intense gamma radiation, right? That's the sort of thing we're dealing with. Now, I don't know what the solution to Fukushima is. I haven't got the faintest idea how you manage a meltdown, but I know the very worst thing to do is pretend it's not happening and put it under a cone of silence, right? I mean, with that going on, we're still mining uranium. It's probably some of our uranium that's going to be coming back through the Pacific Ocean to us, right? Nothing has happened. It's like the country is and the world is sleepwalking into disaster, right? I don't think I'm exaggerating on this. Right? It's the world's biggest nuclear disaster of all times. And I would say without a shadow of a contradiction, if you combined every nuclear accident that's ever happened and joined it in aggregate, it would be small compared to what's happening right now. Right? Everyone knows about Chernobyl because it was the nasty Russians that did it. And we've heard ad nauseum about Chernobyl. That was nothing. That was a chemical explosion in a nuclear facility with a one-off spread of radioisotopes, and I don't downplay that, I mean it's bad enough, but what we've got here is an uncontrolled nuclear fire on our doorstep over our Pacific Ocean and the monkeys are seeing, saying or doing nothing and it really is an issue. Okay sister, there's the only nuclear reactor we use. Australian scientists discovered photovoltaics they needed a small amount of money to capitalise it, but it went off overseas and now we're paying far too much for photovoltaics, right? It's uh, an interesting thing, what we call the last chance for the lucky country. You can squander your luck. We have squandered our luck left, right and centre. And <laughs> once it runs out, it becomes hard luck. Okay, sister. Okay, what's the paradigm shift on media and politics? I don't resile from calling this, whoa, what's that? Okay, a pseudo-democracy. It's not a democracy, right? In a real democracy, the people's voice has some, some saying. We have some meaning to what we think, right? But what's happening here? Almost every policy that's being enacted is against the will of the people. Back in 2003, wasn't it when Australia wanted to take part in the American invasion of Iraq? Sorry about that, mate. So hundreds of thousands of people turned out in opposition. Off we went. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Off we went. It was against the will of the people, right? We were the last country on earth to have hemp seed as a human food. The last country, right? We're lagging so far behind with medical cannabis, it's pathetic. Right? The financial interests of corrupt police are driving the saliva testing. There is no doubt about that. Right? We actually spoke, Andrew Cavasillas did a bit of research on this some years ago, and I ended up having a conversation with Inspector Borman in Victoria, which ended up with sort of mutual FUs and slamming down on the phone. It wasn't a very productive discussion at the end of the day. But they basically know the tests have false positives. They know the tests don't impact on road safety. They don't care. They're making a mozza on selling these crappy tests. Okay, now, yeah, now we're talking about false flags. We're talking about the policy as it currently exists. Remember the overall substance of this talk is a paradigm shift. This is what we've got. This is what we need. Now, Trump and others in America have been talking more and more about false news. And I'm glad that's out in the open because we've been on false news for a long time. Okay, next one. Does anyone remember the Gulf of Tonkin incident? You all look in the right sort of age group. The Gulf of Tonkin is up in uh, near North Vietnam. And I think in 1963, the Americans reported that North Vietnamese torpedo boats attacked one of their warships in international waters and they used that as an excuse to carpet bomb North Vietnam, ending up with the death of three million civilians mostly and five million genetically maimed children. Years later and under their sort of their system, you can release information when it's about 40 years old. When the Gulf of Tonkin reports came out, they admitted blithely that they'd fabricated it. 
There was no torpedo boats. But they wanted a reason to mine Haiphong Harbour and bomb North Vietnam. False flag. Next one, please. OK, is there anyone here that thinks Mr Bin Laden is responsible for the demolition of the World Trade Centre? Anyone at all? They're all in Canberra. Right. <laughs> it is pathetic. Now, I think it was a German propaganda minister said that if you want to tell a lie and get away with it, make sure it's a big lie. Cannabis has no medical use. It causes schizophrenia. It makes you apathetic. Tell a big lie and you're more likely to get away with it. This is one of the most egregious insults on human intelligence that there's ever been. There is unequivocal and undebatable evidence that they were demolished by high elements in the American military, industrial and political context. Right? For years I've been a member of the 9-11 Truth Movement. We toured Professor Jones, an analytical chemist. We could actually see on the electron micrographs the type of explosives they used. It's a militarised thing called thermate. And it's only made at American military laboratories. Right? It's unbelievable. You can make thermite, the simple chemical version of that. And just to prove it to myself, I went and got some powdered aluminium and iron oxide from Bunnings, mix them together and set them off with a sparkler and they burn at 3,000 degrees and they can cut through steel like it's a butter knife. The military version called Thermate was used and it's fascinating that a company run by George Bush's cousin called Ace Elevators reconditioned all the lifts in the building just four weeks before they were demolished and they placed these thermite charges along all the major columns and then let them out from the bottom up so they fell at free fall speed. But the current paradigm is still Bin Laden did it, right? That unleashed a wave of military in intervention in the Middle East with the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, the attempted subversion of Syria, right? These are really serious things. And it just glosses over, it gets no real discussion. Oh, that Catalaris is a bloody conspiracy theorist, right? So what if there's a mass of scientific evidence? That doesn't matter. You start calling people a conspiracy theorist and you could ignore everything you say. It gets harder in the case of cannabis when the facts keep staring them in the face, the cured babies, the cured children and the better adults. But we don't want the facts to spoil a good story. Okay, next please. Okay, what's their health and drug policy? The allopathically trained medical doctors have asserted that their form of medicine is the only valid and real medicine because it's tested. But yet they remain strangely silent that the incidence of many serious diseases, especially cancer, autism, autoimmunity, are getting more and more common and not subtly more common, right? And then they blithely announce, oh, every second person will have cancer by 2030. Hello, right? And we just sit there saying, oh, well, I hope it's not me. <laughs> it's really, really sad what we're dealing with here, right? We've got a system, I've repeatedly referred to it as the fox minding the pigeons. That's what our health system is at the moment, right? They're not looking for, there's this fantasy of chasing the cure for cancer. Well, what should you really do? You should go chasing the cause of the cancer. The cause of the cancers in most cases are basically nutritional. Destruction of the mitochondria by oxidative stress, wrong dietary choices for fats and lipids, degradation of the, the food supply. All this was worked out way back in the 30s, Otto Warburg, What's this? A spotlight. <laughs> Otto Warburg worked out most of the physiology of cancer in the 1930s and he was given a Nobel Prize for it and then his work was shelved, basically. Go and Google it for yourself. Probably one of the most brilliant medical researchers, physiologists that I've ever read or, or known about, as I said, he was awarded with a Nobel Prize back in the 30s and then just totally ignored like he didn't exist. Really, really sad. Okay, fluoride, 
we've really got to talk about fluoride. I was having a debate with someone from the Republican Party and I said, and I really meant what I said, we won't get this country in any form of legal reform until we get the fluoride out of the drinking water. Oh, that's a bit extreme, isn't it, Andrew? No. Most people aren't aware that 90% of the countries that used to fluoridate the water in the 40s and 50s no longer do for serious health concerns. There's 200 published studies linking maternal fluoride exposure to reduced IQ in their children. Right? I've done 1,200 post-mortems. The amount of calcification in the pineal gland or just the total atrophy of the pineal gland, and no one knows what it's about. But if you had an organ in someone's brain that most people in this country <laughs> appear to be atrophying or calcifying, well, we don't know what it's about. You know, the, some of the older religious see it, it's the third eye, the, the spiritual sort of guide. I don't know what the pineal gland is, but I know if a population has something like 90, 95% of calcification in that gland, you really ought to look at what's going on, right? I don't think I'm the only one in this country that's noticed that the country's becoming more and more apathetic. Even the activists are becoming more and more apathetic. Now, how many people here take active steps to avoid fluoride? Ah, oh, good, okay. For the few that didn't put up their hands, learn from the people around you, right? It's sometimes difficult to avoid the fluoride because it's in almost everything now. It's become ubiquitous. And for those that don't know, it's actually sourced as a waste product of fertilizer manufacture for the Shanghai Rock Phosphate Company. That's where we get our fluoride from at the moment. It's also co-contaminated with arsenic, lead and cadmium. But the government buys this stuff and as long as it's got less than one milligram a litre, one part per million of lead, they say it's okay, they don't even test for the arsenic. Right? It is bizarre. So in terms of importance, I consider the fluoride issue one of the pivotal issues in this country because whilst it continues, the apathy will deepen, right? The lack of drive will exacerbate. So I really urge you to have a look at it and not only for personal avoiding of that, but join the Fluoride Action Network, get involved. Right? It's hard because everyone's burdened with their day-to-day -day living. It's, it's a bit like keeping barefoot and pregnant. You know, the old saying is how you keep the women down, barefoot and pregnant. But people have become burdened work slaves. And while they're doing it, they're just sort of trudging off to extinction. So you have to find time. You don't say, I'm too busy. Right? It's too important not to find the time to be an activist in one way or another. Right? Not everyone can sort of be on the front lines all the time. But do something. It's not even that important what you do as long as you're doing something. And joining the Fluoride Action Network I think would be a very good start because five, six, seven years after that stop, we'll start to see an uptick in the quality. I mean, I used to like being called an Australian when I was overseas, like back in the 60s. They were a good lot of people. They were rugged, they were independent, you know, they, but now it's, it's really a painful lot of, we call them sheeple, most of them now. A third of them are grossly overweight and, and the rest are sort of, you know, let's just say they put their minds on hold and that's a very dangerous situation. You don't close your eyes when you're driving a car. When you're driving a planet, both eyes should be wide open if we're to have a quality future. Okay, arbitrary distinction between legal and illegal drugs. I have to express my most profound dissatisfaction with what's happened with medical cannabis. This isn't what we spent 25 years of hard agitation to have a bunch of greedy mongrels in the corporate world sell us their highly priced snake oils. Now we heard from Michael and some of the others that raw cannabis, and there's talk of THCA, CBDA, the acidic raw form of the cannabis, firstly is much better tolerated by people who aren't seeking a recreational experience or a psychotropic experience, and it has a much enhanced therapeutic value. So 
if I had my way for children with epilepsy, say, the first thing I'd treat them with would be a raw form of cannabis. But none of the pharmaceutical offerings are offering THCA or CBDA. Why is that? Right? What the direction that I personally want to see medical cannabis going, and I've spoken about this on a number of occasions, and it'll be the subject of the, the last part of the talk, I'll wind this up fairly soon, about the policies of the hemp party. But what we want to see is a three-tier supply system. Right? Everyone's running like sort of a little weasels trying to get in the government good books and getting this license and that license. We want a three-tier supply system. First tier is home growing. And that should not be interfered with, right? My model of how a lot of the children that we deal with is that we supply them with either seed or preferably cuttings, clones, of a sort. We try them on different preparations or different herbs, find the one that suits them best, and then supply the family with cuttings. Backyard growing is very simple. There is nothing like the care that a concerned parent gives to the plants. And you end up with cannabis at a minute fraction of the cost. It can then be consumed in its whole form. There is absolutely no need to make tinctures or oils or any form of extraction. We've achieved very good therapeutic results simply putting a wide amount of bud into a hemp seed smoothie. Right? How simple is that? And there's no place for pharmaceutical companies in this. That's the first tier. And we'll basically attract those people that are interested in a relationship with the plant and are functioning at a slightly higher sort of spiritual level. Some people are either too sick or too infirm or don't have the physical capacity. Then we have boutique growers like the good people here, like um, all, all the people you'll meet outside in the, um, in the courtroom here that have a passion for growing medical cannabis and producing it in the form that's most useful for people. The third stage then is pharmaceuticals. And if they want to sell cannabis at $200 a gram, which is what they're doing, $200 a gram, right? It's many multiples of the black market price. I mean, our best um, resin producer has pegged the price at $30 a gram, which is really a very reasonable price for what you're getting. But $200 a gram puts it out of the... the the, the reach of most people. You're, a, say, a single mum or a single dad with a child with autism and one with epilepsy. I mean, your bill for cannabis alone would be two, $200,000 a year if you go by the pharmaceutical route and you won't get the raw product. It's a tragedy that we're allowing to happen by our inattention to who's, like I said, the fox is minding the pigeons. And cannabis should not be allowed to become a cash cow for a, a group of greedy mongrels because that's the way it's going at the moment. Okay, that's enough. Um, next, please. This is, I mean, people, if you don't learn the lessons of history, um, we won't make progress. Have people seen these ads from the 50s? More doctors smoke camel than it. Go to the next one, sister. How about that one? Right? We laugh about it, but it's tragic. Right? Coca-Cola are now considering putting a CBD-infused cola beverage. Right? There is no end to it. Coca-Cola used to be billed as the most refreshing drink on earth. It had 5% cocaine in it. I'm sure it was. But now it's just a poison, sugary blend of God knows what. Next, please. I like this one how mother and baby picked up with Blatt's beer. You got that? Now, I know they're not very clear. They're saying a case of Blatt's beer in your home means much to the young mother and obviously baby participates in its benefit. If you want fetal alcohol syndrome, get that Blatt's beer into you. It'll be all right. <laughs> but this was official advertising, right? And don't laugh because the current crop of advertising will be looked at by people in the future in the same way. Oh, Prozac, that'll fix your depression. Valium, anxiety, no problems, it's gone. It's the same thing, they've just changed it. Once you can't give beer to the baby, we'll give them Prozac instead. Next, please. Obesity. Where do I start on this one? 
The dietitians, which are really just the sort of the dietetic arm of the allopathic medical profession, have taken action against a surgeon in Tasmania because he told his diabetic patients, he said he just got sick of cutting off their legs. So he started telling them to cut down on the sugar, right? And he was getting good results. Their blood sugars were going down and things. They complained to the Healthcare Complaints Commission that he was operating in an area outside of his medical expertise. Right? Can you believe it? Yet a third of the country looks like that and these people haven't got their head on the chopping block. Right? We have only ourselves to blame. Don't forget that. Okay, next. Yeah, flu vax. Here's a good one. Now, you can't read that, but I'll, I'll read it out for you. There's been no control. This is the product information put out by the company. This is on page one of the PI, the product information. There have been no control trials adequately demonstrating a decrease in influenza um, after this immunisation. Right? The whole idea the allopaths are meant to have credibility is their gold standard control trials. But here... We've got something that's being threatened with being made compulsory, right? Where the product information says that there's been no trials. You go and find me a trial on fluoride demonstrating safety. They don't exist. And now I'm investigating some legal way of actually challenging the people that, like the NH and MRC especially. But with immunisation, they've given them exemptions from civil action. Right? So say you get one of these products and you collapse with encephalitis or something really serious, which can occur, you can't sue them. It's bizarre. Okay, next one. Uh, that's really poor. Okay, my IT skills aren't that good, but I got this from a thumb sketch, but I'll explain what it is because you can go and find the original one on the internet. This is called Dr. Declan's um, cancer map and he got figures from the British Cancer Registry so they're kosher figures and what you can see up on the top uh, top right in the way you're looking at it is Northern Ireland which isn't fluoridated and Southern Ireland which is and each one of these represents the incidence of a certain can of different cancers pancreatic uh, leukemia and it might be GIT. It doesn't matter, there was five different cancers, this is just three of them. Cut a long story short, the green, which is at the top, is the lowest incidence and the purple is the highest incidence. And basically, in the Florida, see, Ireland is homogeneous genetically. They're all similar genes. So you can't say, oh, it's the genes that are making the southerners more cancer prone, because they're the same people, really. There's just political differences. There's basically 20% more cancer, 30% uh, more cancer in fluoridated island than non-fluoridated island, right? And then the critics pointed, oh, but look, there's some little areas here, and they, they sort of pointed to this sort of little areas in Southern Ireland where the incidence was as low as Northern. Then they went and looked at it and said the people had sabotaged the fluoridation project, right? <laughs> it's a big problem. Right? And it's not a problem that's just easily fixed by going and buying plastic spring water from here and there. We simply have to stop it. And in my opinion, it is the single most important thing we can do to advance Australia fair, is get the fluoride out. Because over time, our kids will be brighter. Like, we have to face the reality that we're slipping down the academic scale internationally. Right? Our first year uni students are operating at the same level as the Singaporeans high school students. You know, they're better high school students. It is shocking. And you can watch the decline in the US the same. All the fluoridated countries, remember there's only about 5 or 10% of the world's population being fluoridated, but they're all the suckers, the Brits, the Americans, the Aussies. Right? It's a big issue. And you try and get a debate started and see what reaction you get. But you've got to be brave, you've got to be confident of your facts. Right? I, was, I was trying to have a debate with us, or a, not a debate, to educate a school teacher. And he said, oh, you couldn't find me a single study that shows dangerous. I said, give me 90 seconds and I'll get you 200. And I wasn't exaggerating. I said, okay, you've brought it up. You find me a single study that's been done to demonstrate safety. Right? And the same thing applies with immunisation. Now, I'm trained as an immunologist and I actually support the idea of immunisation as a 
interesting way of reducing the burden of disease, but unfortunately the disease of corporate profitability has insinuated itself into the whole process and we're getting a very second rate result where they're not actually seeking ways of improving it. See, say the cars in the 1950 compared to the cars now. If you have a crash in an old car versus a new car, your survivability is much higher now because they've constantly evolved safer ways of doing it. It should be the same with immunisation, but they haven't changed it one little bit. And they also haven't changed the way they measure the effectiveness. Just like the influenza, where they said there's been no studies that demonstrate that it actually reduces influenza, what it does is just demonstrates an antibody rise. Right? But if you catch influenza, you catch it through your nose, you don't catch it through your skin. Right? So if you immunise through the skin, it evokes a different sort of antibody response than if you breathe it in. So the immunisation should start with nasal administration, just like they did with typhoid fever. Instead, you don't catch typhoid fever through your skin, you get it through your gut. So you're now immunised by drinking it. Right? So the immunisation is a good process, but it's just done wrong. Right? They added mercury to it to make it easier to pass the regulatory test, not to get a better result, right? but just to pass because it, it stimulates, it hyper-stimulates the immune system. So you end up with more antibodies, but they're not protective antibodies. But then the white coat guys can say, look, we've got antibodies. And I say, yeah, yeah, but you also got sick kids. Right? So that's another big issue. There's a lot of big issues. OK, next one, please. Cannabis prohibition. Has anyone here seen Billion Dollar Crop, the documentary that was made in the 1995s? Ah, oh, good on you. Gee, gee, that's really sad. Okay, you can YouTube it if you don't believe what I say. But we made a documentary in 1995, 1995, that actually indicated, and it, it's really all come, come true, what we're saying, the cannabis prohibition was brought on not to reduce or not for any concern about the medical uses of cannabis, but to destroy the hemp industries. And in fact, I started my agitation concerning cannabis in 1988 concerning hemp, because that is one of the vehicles we can use to try and rescue this planet, right? Since about the 1920s, there's been an acceleration of a transition from what we call a carbohydrate world. It used to be everything in the world was made from plants, carbohydrates, right? But then with the robber barons in the 20s, the Rockefellers and the usual bunch of villains, we transited to hydrocarbons. So instead of carbohydrates, we transited to hydrocarbons, which are toxic, they're not biodegradable, we end up having big wars over who owns them, right? We have to transit back to carbohydrates. And with the technology we've got now, we can make anything that the plastics industry can make better from carbohydrates, right? We can make hempcrete building material. We can make degradable hemp plastics. We can make beautiful fabrics, right? That don't outsource microplastics into the environment. Every time you wear a polyester shirt and wash it, you lose a half a gram of microplastics that you can't see, but it builds up. There was a study done on one of the islands around Hawaii, 40% of the weight of the beach sand was microplastics. Have you got that? 40% of the weight of the beach, sure, it was in the gyra, and other beaches won't be as high, but I mean, if it's 1%, or, you know, 1 40th of 1%, that's too much for, for, for me. Okay. So, yeah, next one, please. I really think it's worth having a look at um, Billion Dollar Crop, just to put you in the picture. It's really interesting, the American states have had legal medical cannabis now, for some of them, for 20 years in California, but only last year did they legalise hemp growing. Can you get that? You could grow a 20% THC plant legally, say in California, but you couldn't grow a 1% plant for industrial use. Luckily now, they've unleashed a wave of economic energy in the United States. I mean, they were a big hemp growing country. And as you'll see from Billion Dollar Crop, during the Second World War, see, they made cannabis illegal in 1937. I don't want to be preaching to the converted, but if you haven't seen Billion Dollar Crop, you may not know the history. 
They, the global prohibition, there was a lot of little laws, but the global prohibition started in 1937 when they passed the Marijuana Transfer Tax Act. And basically, to pay, they didn't make it illegal, because at that stage, making drugs illegal wasn't the accepted thing. And the Americans have been using medical cannabis for, for centuries. It was a major medicine. In fact, it was the third most prescribed medicine used at the time. So, you know, it was used by Queen Victoria, you know, all that sort of stuff. So what they did, they put a transfer tax on it. That means if you were going to sell hemp fabric or anything, you had to pay a transfer tax, and then they didn't issue the certificates. So they basically banned it by the back door. During the Second World War, they realised that nylon couldn't actually supply the sort of quantity and quality of fibre they needed for the war effort, so they re-legalised hemp farming. In fact, they made it compulsory to grow hemp during the Second World War. And from 1941 to 1945, they increased from virtually nothing to 240,000 acres each year. And you'll see all this in the original footage. We went over on a fact-finding study to the United States back in 1994, and we knew that they'd made a documentary called uh, hemp for victory, and we even knew its Dewey number because Jack Herrer had given it to me, right? So we went over with a film crew with the big camera on their shoulders, and we were going through the Dewey index, and where it should have been, you know, it was sort of seven, nine. So where's eight, right? And um, we asked the curator, it was a rhetorical question, I said, you know, where's, where's this one? Oh, I don't know anything about that, sir, right? That's the Orwellian issue of trying to rewrite history. They had the hemp and made it compulsory. In fact, the first law in the United States concerning cannabis was in Virginia, way back in the first settlement. It was compulsory, 10% of your agricultural land had to be planted to hemp. Right, you could pay your taxes in hemp fibre, and that's something that we could actually consider going back to. But the problem now, we're behind the eight ball. Like We've had legal hemp since 2008, but there's a lot of real practical reasons why the industry hasn't been able to expand for want of a tiny amount of investment. So we're up to about 600 hectares now. The US in its second year up to 60,000 hectares. So we hope there's going to be a wave of reindustrialization, um, things like building materials, all sorts of hemp plastics. So there may be a bright hemp future. In terms of health, I can only encourage you to include hemp seed as a part of your daily diet. Right? The genesis of many of the diseases that I mentioned earlier is concerning the lack of omega-3 in our current diets and the gross imbalance between omega-3 being deficient and omega-6 being in excess. You all familiar with this sort of concept? The omega-3 type fatty acids have a calming effect on the body. The omega-6 have a stimulating or inflammatory effect and the body works by keeping things in dynamic balance pulling this way and that way, so it's just at the right level. When the ratio is one to three, people are in generally good health and they don't suffer from degenerative disorders. But when it gets to one to five, or some of the Americans on their SAD diet or their standard American diet, it gets to one to 10. And we're seeing premature aging, right? I mean, even within my lifetime, I've seen the incidence of bowel cancer drop from being an old person's disease to a young person's disease. Same with breast cancer used to be almost only old women, 50s and 60s, even 70s, got the breast cancer. Now it's bloody late 20s and 30s, right? I don't want to panic you, but if you're not worried, you're asleep, right? It's, it's like, say, there's a bushfire just down there. So, oh, it'll be all right, right? It won't be if the wind changes because it'll blow right over you, right? And once we lose the resilience of our health, and most of us don't have that resilience anymore. The population's getting weaker, more dependent on medications. Now, coming back to fluoride, how many people here, just for interest, have got some issue with their thyroid? Okay, you, you're very underrepresented in this group because they're avoiding fluoride, right? The fluoride is a potent <coughs> thyroid poison. There's no doubt about that. Worse than that, the diets now are grossly deficient in iodine. 
In the old days, they used to add, sorry, in the old days with the milking, they used to swab the teeth with iodine and it got into the milk. They used iodine as a leavening agent in the bread, but some commercial creep found it was cheaper to use bromide instead of the iodine. And not only does it, you lack getting the iodine, but the bromide competes with the iodine, as does fluoride. It competes, and so there's now an epidemic of hypo or underperforming thyroid function, right? And this thing called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune attack on the thyroid by a disordered immune system and exposing antigens in the thyroid because of chronic inflammation, right? Thyroxin is the largest selling substance on earth, the largest selling pharmaceutical substance on earth. And it really is just a expensive preform way of taking iodine, right? The Allopath's recommendation for iodine is 150 micrograms a day for an adult. That's one seventh of a milligram, right? In countries that have four to eight milligrams a day, they have better health outcomes, right? And they're non-fluoridated. So really do your own research on this but you do well. I've, I've actually, because it's hard to get quality iodine supplements, because they're all sold in microgram doses. So if you want to get a useful dose, and a minimum useful dose is about four milligrams, you might have to take 20 tablets at a dose because they formulate them as though that's what's needed. Right? So it's, it's a big problem. And it's a big problem that's getting worse and it will continue to get worse until we actually take our health into our own hands, firstly, and putting the responsibility for the deteriorating health we're all suffering, or all those that are suffering from it are suffering, on the people who are causing it. Is that an unreasonable position? You made the mess, you clean it up. Okay, what's next? Ah, uh, the decor. I oh, know we, we all. We can watch the movie and get the whole story about the decorticator. Next one, please. That's next one too. You'll see all this in that. Yeah, this is this is how the propaganda started. I mean, has anyone seen anyone injecting cannabis? Well, why are they put marijuana and there we're getting a shot in the arm? It's just nonsense. Weird orgies, wild parties, unleashed passions. You know, these are emotive terms. God, I wish it was as good as they said. That's <laughs> Okay, next one, please. Yeah, look, look at this. I mean, this is psychopathic. And this is what they used to bring in the reefer madness campaign. This is where reefer madness. Okay, next one. Are you all familiar with the Henry Ford plastic car made in 1941? One sixth the weight of steel, 10 times its impact resistance, shelved. Right? You imagine the impact. We wouldn't have to have a climate change debate if that one invention had taken off, because we'd be growing plenty of hemp, we wouldn't need the coal and the steel, we wouldn't need panel beaters, our insurance would be way low. 1941 technology, it's real easy to do. Okay, next. Golly. Oh, yeah, no, go back to that. That's okay. I've I got to improve my IT skills. That's the first hempcrete building we made in, in Sydney. It's maybe doesn't look much in the ghost of that.